Hi there, how you doing? This is a, a video to help um, the interpretation of the thunderstorms and radar map discussion assignment or map interpretation assignment. So in that assignment you're given um, three images and you're asked to first diagnose what kind of storms they are and then second um, describe what are the this, the um, environment, the conditions that, that lead to those storms and, and some of the potential for damage, you know. Um, so both, you know, what conditions support the storm and then what kind of damage and generally which are the quote-unquote worst storms um, to see. Um, so what this video is to just strictly help you with that first part, help you um, uh, see in action um, an analysis of three different, of one of each of the three different types of storms and to give you some hints on on what to look for um, in a little bit we'll talk about the conditions so we're going to go in order from single cell to multi-cell to supercell which is kind of the escalation in severity um, in general they can all be severe um, but in general single cell is usually a little less severe than multi-cell which is usually a little less severe and a supercell with exceptions all up and down in between. Um, but in general, uh, we'll get started. So um, this is for um, the fall 2012 uh, class. I suspect we'll probably recycle this video later, but it's right now it's November of 2012. So um, this is an example of single cell storms. So this is the coast of Texas right along here and um, you see a bunch of poorly organized single cell storms single cell in, the, in that they are generally there's one center of kind of higher reflectivity uh, radar signals and they're all kind of separated they're not really joined they don't seem highly organized these are what we would call in the south, maybe a, a, a television meteorologist in the south would call popcorn thunderstorms. They go up, they cause some brief heavy rain, maybe some small hail, and they come back down. They typically go up in an environment without a great deal of instability or a great deal of shear, and um, these are kind of the afternoon summer thunderstorms that uh, we've all grown up with, especially those of us in the plains and in the south. Um, and, and in the Northeast as well. So again, um, not a lot of organization to these. They tend to be distinct from each other. They may pop up in clusters or, or near each other, but they don't seem to be well organized. There isn't a real obvious system tying all of these together. Um, they're, they're also uh, pretty small. They're not, not huge storms. Um, each one of these storms is a single updraft. One updraft that goes up, produces rain and hail, which is what shows up on the radar here, which falls down. So single updraft in each one of those blobs. So this little neighborhood has three single cell storms going up. Three updrafts kind of distinct and separate from each other. Those are single cell storms. Those are what might be called popcorn storms or garden variety thunderstorms. I, I don't know what they call them in Aaron's book, but that's what they're referred to a lot. So the next is multi-cell thunderstorms. So here is, uh, this is the remnants of a tropical storm over Oklahoma back in 2007. You can kind of see a, a neat eye feature here, but what I'm gonna focus on is what the radar picked up on this spiral band, or what looks kind of like a spiral band. And you can see big reflectivity returns over several counties connected, well organized. Um, so lots of bright colors, which means higher reflectivity, which means stronger updraft and bigger particles and more rain being suspended up there. Um, and typically stronger winds as well. So the fact that these are in organized in bands or lines, um, that, those are the characteristics of multi-cell thunderstorms. They tend to be grouped by a common feature, so there's a, a dynamic feature, in this case it's the rotation to do with the uh, tropical storm um, that, is, that is basically organizing these many cells together. So um, 
there are updrafts all up and down this band. So if you were to see, if you were to look visually with your eyes and look at these storms, you would see several towers going up and they'd all be kind of connected together, but they, you know, these are individual or not these are individual updrafts organized by a larger feature um, that usually go up in a highly sheared environment. Um, in in this case, not so much, but they're dynamically driven. They're being uh, uh, organized by a larger dynamical feature, and they're connected. They they show up as lines or bands or large clusters where there's several blobs of high reflectivity stormy patterns together. Um, again, this is a multi-cell storm. It's between single cell and super cell in the expectations for severity. Typically, multi-cell storms can do um, quite a bit of damage if they're higher end with straight line winds, sometimes with hail as well. But the, the derecho event, the folks on the East Coast um, in the DC area got in the summer of 2012, that's an example of a multi-cell storm. Um, that's a really, really high end multi-cell storm, but it's an organized pattern of just of, of many updrafts aligned in an organized band and it came through and did a lot of straight line wind damage. Um, so uh, bow echoes, derechos, squall lines. If you ever hear someone call, talk about a, a, a mesoscale convective system, which you may not ever hear that again and you're probably better off if you don't. Those are all examples of multi-cell um, multi thunderstorms can be severe, typically are severe more often than single cell thunderstorms. Their main threats are straight line winds, and in some cases really strong straight line winds, and they can produce severe hail as well. Um, the last category is supercell thunderstorms, and these are examples of supercell thunderstorms, and they differ from um, single cell thunderstorms in that they are bigger and they have very high reflectivities. So here is a supercell storm, and here is a supercell storm. This is from May 3rd, 1999. If you lived in and around Oklahoma, that's a, a pretty bad day in Oklahoma City history. Um, supercell thunderstorms are different than single cell thunderstorms in that they last a long time, they have higher reflectivities, they are larger, and they, yeah, they're just bigger. And uh, they have some other characteristics we'll talk about in a second. They're different from multi-cell storms in that this storm and this storm are one thing out there, not connected by high reflectivities to other storms. This is basically one unit separated from this unit out in, out in on its own. So there's it's not a big blob of storms. Maybe like up here, someone could argue that, that there's some multi-cell features up here, but for these, they're definitely on their own. They're definitely um, big and noticeable, and they have some other features that we'll talk about right now. So each of these, in its own way, has a pretty distinct hook echo. Happens to be on the southwest side of this storm, happens to be on the southwest side of this storm, where the uh, reflectivity actually wraps around and makes a little hook. And you can see um, that the hook happens to be on the southwest side of each of these supercells. And uh, that's pretty typical. Most supercells in the U.S., which can happen anywhere in the U.S., but they typically um, are associated with the plains, the south, the Midwest. Um, those have them more often. But all regions of the U.S. can get supercells. Um, typical that the hook would be on the southwest side. In some situations, uh, the hook may, they may not look as classic as this, but for our course, this will do. So, what is the hook? Um, uh, basically, what's going on in the vicinity of a hook is a large rotating updraft. Uh, the high reflectivity part of the hook, um, in both of these, the rotation is counterclockwise. Um, so that would be, uh, if we zoomed in, something like this. But that rotation is, low, is in the vicinity of the hook. Um, the hook itself is just material that's getting wrapped around the backside of the storm. Um, by this rotating updraft. There is an inflow notch in each of these storms. That's that clear area, that low reflectivity area. That's the warm moist air getting pulled into the storm 
hasn't yet made big hailstones and raindrops that show up on radar yet. Um, that's what the hooks are. Um, depending on where the storm is relative to the radar, a hook may be really pronounced, may be really hard to distinguish, and may not even be able to be seen by radar. In this case, um, it is. These are very clearly supercell thunderstorms. Um, this western storm, the, the left one on the left of the two, also shows kind of a butterfly pattern. You can, you can almost imagine a V-shape um, extending north and east from the hook-like pattern. Um, so you can almost see butterfly wings kind of showing up. And what those are is you have this large rotating updraft, and um, it actually is, is strong enough um, and large enough to disturb the flow that's coming at higher levels and it leaves this this wake effect. Um, so it's just like sticking your finger in a stream. You're going to see a V downstream from, from where your finger is. It's exactly what's happening with that particular storm is that um, the very strong updraft right here down by the hook is actually um, showing a downstream V. Not important for this class, just kind of cool. One of the many little things other than a hook echo and rotation that people uh, look for to distinguish supercells. Um, so what do supercells do? Well, they're um, typically the most severe of the type, three types of storms that we discussed today. Um, they are um, responsible for the vast, vast majority of tornadoes and especially large tornadoes, F2 and above. Almost all of them come from supercells. Um, supercells can produce really giant hail. Um, uh, they uh, are responsible for almost all of the gigantic hail stones that are that are um, discovered. And um, to some extent, you know, depending on where you are in the storm, straight line winds are still an issue with supercells as well. There's a lot of really dynamic, powerful forces going on. Um, we talk about in another video, which I'll make available, um, the role of shear in setting up supercells. But that's it. Those are the three types of, of storms. If um, uh, These should look a lot like the storms that are on your assignment. You should be able to make a pretty distinct choice and apply each of these images, which are available through your resources tab, um, to the images shown in the storms, and hopefully be able to describe uh, some of the conditions that set these storms up and some of the types of weather um, and hazards and threats that uh, each of them brings. All of them brings a threat of, of lightning, um, and lightning kills a lot of people. Uh, in many years, lightning kills more people than tornadoes, so um, all of them can bring lightning, definitely a hazard for all of them. Um, the higher end severe weather, typically limited to the multi-cell, and especially the supercell thunderstorms. Um, at the time we recorded this, Hurricane Sandy was still, uh, we were still feeling the effects. So those of you in the Northeast that are dealing with the consequences of Sandy, um, hope you're doing well. P uh, please, I understand if you're uh, late getting assignments in. That also goes for those of you in the reserves um, and the Guard that have been, um, uh, have had some new responsibilities because of Hurricane Sandy. So thank you for your service. Please stay safe. Please stay in touch with your family. Um, and when you get a chance, please stay in touch with your uh, instructor. Uh, have, a, have a great week, um, and uh, thanks for participating in this class.